Chris, all you do is win. Win, win, no matter what. Tell me, do you have money on your mind? Can you ever get enough? Can I tell you right now, I feel like I was the king of losing. I was the loser over and over and over again. And now, now the whole path is starting to make sense. You have to, as an entrepreneur, as a real estate investor, as a developer, uh, you've got to go out there and you've got to be willing to freaking screw it all up royally, but then learn from it because you're not going to get paid in dollars in the beginning. Most people never do. They get paid in lessons. And if you can't find the lesson, if you can't search for the lesson, if you can't see the lesson, then all you're going to do is give up. And you're like, oh, I tried that and I failed. And if you fail enough, then what you do is you develop yourself into a failure. I'm a person who fails at stuff. The reality is we got it all wrong. It's not failure, man. You've got to embrace the suck. You're going to suck. And you have to be okay sucking in exchange for the lessons. What is more important to you? What, what is worth more to you in an individual? Hustle or know-how? Hustle. Why? Um, dude, I was just talk, talking on the phone with this lady who launched Diesel. I'm trying to think of like the other brands, like these huge Diesel brands. shoes? No, like Diesel, they started as watches. Right? Yeah, yeah. These, they, they, they eventually got shoes to now, shoes. shoes now. This lady over the last 30 years has, has launched some amazing high-end brands. Now she's shifting gears, getting into the influencer space, Stacia. Okay. And she's like, dude, I just like to grind and hustle and figure things out. And I, I, it's like, if you were to say, wow, degree or hustle, what's more important? Hustle. Um, like, what's more important? Like, positive attitude or hustle? Like, I'm going to take hustle every single time. A million dollar investment or hustle? Hustle. Really? Dude, a million dollars is such a stupid small amount of money. We have, we've created this energy and feeling on money. We're like, oh, millionaire. Like, do you realize that a million is nothing? Do you, last episode, Stan the Annuity Man. You give Stan a million bucks, <laughs> the guy's going to give you three or 4% on that. He'll never tell you that that's oh, his I number. Oh, I know. We could but not I know, get could him. not peg him. That, that stubborn he would dude. Not talk about ROI. But I'm just saying, what is that? What is that, like three grand a month? $2,600 a month? Like, it, like a million dollars, it's not what it used to be. No, a million dollars is just a small amount of money. If you're trying to set yourself up for a really basic level of financial success for retirement, three million. Like, this bottom line, million dollars annuitized will keep you at 100 grand a year. Without, without eating into your principal. With that, and that's the key, right? Most people, when they imagine so a million dollars, a million hustle, dollars. It's like, I, I was thinking today, what if I started from scratch today? First of all, I remember when I was learning directly from Tony Robbins at his feet, and the dude says, he's in his 60s now. Basically, he started over his entire life at 50. Like he had gone through divorce, he had lost mm -hmm. everything. The 2008 crisis literally took his business. He started from scratch, but you know what he had? He had 30 years of learning which meant that he could build an empire as best as I could do, tell, um, was doing like hundreds of millions. I was guessing between three and $500 million a year in business in that decade, in his 50s. And I'm like, that's how I kind of feel. Like I just entered my 40s and I'm doing better this year than I've done the last two decades combined. It's because of the lessons. So who cares about the money? Strip it all away. I'm gonna have my best year ever right now as long as I'm in the growth mindset as long as I'm a warrior and I keep growing. Chris, for a long time, I have wanted to do a, some sort of series where we strip you of everything, drop you off in some metropolitan area. Like I don't naked, know. Like buck naked. Yeah, you're, you're like got your underwear and that's it. And maybe like a $50 bill and be like, okay, how long is it going to take you? And you can't use any of your previous resources. Yes. The question is, to do it? can I catch an Uber in my underwear, even if I have money? I don't know. I don't know that you can. I don't know. I think we'll they let, turn yeah, the right around. They, people we'll, have standards. We'll, we'll snatch you up <laughs> right after the gym. Dude, the, the reality, Carson, is I'm playing that game all the time. Yeah. Every time I have a new business idea, every time I look at a new deal, I tackle it not from a space of comfortable, what do I have? I tackle it from uh, as if I'm starting from scratch. But the reality is I'm never starting from scratch because... I am so much smarter this year. And man, this is going to sound a little arrogant, but truthfully, if you are constantly in a mindset of growing and asking, what's the lesson? What's the lesson? What's the lesson? See, most people don't ask what the lesson is. They say, who hurt me? 
Who did it? And what should I, what should I take away? Don't trust people. Okay. Those are the lessons of the unconscious. The unconscious mind is all bull crap. It's all victim. It has nothing, nothing good to learn. When something happens, you don't like, you've got to stop and say, where's the silver lining? What is the good in this? How is this benefiting me? Not like this, uh, like positivity, like, oh, how does this, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. No, I mean, literally, it's a good song. how are you genuinely becoming a better human being because of the shit that you just shoveled? That's what we have to ask ourselves. So for me, there's no bad because I always find something better. Dude, Napoleon, Napoleon Hill nailed it, man. The guy said, in every single failure, in, 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 in every bad situation, in every horrible circumstance, there's a, se there's a seed of equal or greater opportunity. And so it's not just this, oh, have a positive mindset. You're literally asking yourself, with this bad thing comes something better. Where is it? What is it? Show me. And by the way, the more bad that happens, the more good you get. It doesn't mean I'm on my knees praying for bad to happen, but I'm just telling you that the moment something ugly shows up, I'm just pausing and saying, there's something way more beautiful that is also here. Where is it? And if you don't ask, if you're not looking for it, you usually won't find it. So I'm always saying that people want opportunity, right? They're like, yeah. I'm looking for opportunities, but then they don't recognize them when they come because opportunity comes dis disguised as- Problems. A problem, Yeah, yeah. right? How many companies that are huge today came out of the 2008 recession? Dude, I'm looking at the companies I'm courting today that I want to do business with. And because of all of my success, stacking on all of my success, I now have the right to walk into doors and boardrooms that I would have never been permitted before. And I get to suggest things. Like I've got a company I'm looking at right now where if I said, move out of the way, I'm going to put a CEO in here. We're going to quadruple things. You're going to give me a quarter of your company. And there's people that are not, not going to entertain that. And so you got to understand that there's a momentum to success. And when you're in a place where you're losing a lot, in, instead of being afraid that your next move is going to be a lose, you got to stop and actually capture all of the good that you haven't gotten. I think there's an awakening, Carson, at some point in your life where we have to pause. And, and I'm going to actually recommend you listening right now, do this one activity. Kid you not, I want you to sit down and make a list of the crappiest things that have ever happened to you. I want you to make a list of the things that you hate the most, the people you hate the most, the people who have hurt you the most. I want you to think of the circumstances that were the most painful, um, whether they make you angry or whether they make you sad, whatever brings that out, or insecurity, anxiety. I want you to make a list of the top 10 most negative experiences of your life. And by the way, if in this moment you're like, yeah, I can make that list, then it means you haven't learned the lessons. So you're going to make the list. And the very next thing you're going to do is you're going to sit, get in a calm meditative state, breathe nice and deep in, in through the nose, out through the mouth. You're going to dope your brain with oxygen. You're going to get yourself real calm, maybe throw on some, some, some hokey like spa meditation music. Just get yourself in a calm space. Look at what happened and ask, what good has come from this? What good can come from this? What am I learning from this? How is this actually good? When you ask these kind of questions, and if you're truly open, you're going to start getting the kind of information that you had that bad experience for in the first place. Most of us are sitting on piles of near learned lessons that we have not harvested. And literally today could be your reaping day. Today could be the day of reaping all those lessons. Make a list of the 10 worst things that have ever happened to you and then ask genuinely. And, and you're going to keep asking until you find good that is greater than the bad. And when you take the top 10 worst moments of your life and you can create more good in each one of them that outweighs the bad, you'll know you get there because you step into gratitude. You actually become thankful for what you experienced. Just like when you slap your hand, someone explained to me, once they, they took their hand, they said, smack it as hard as you can. And if you smack your hands really hard, they hurt. But the stinging eventually will go away. When something quote unquote bad happens, you feel that initial sting. You feel soured by it. You feel skeptical or pessimistic. You feel angry. You feel like you should be cautious or take fewer risks. You feel like you should protect yourself, get all fetal position like. But when you can get to the thank you from the pain and you transcend the pain to get the lesson, 
that is when you become the greatness that was always inside of you. You're just now manifesting it. You're now showing it. And there's people that I look up to. There's people we all look up to. We're like, man, how did they get so powerful? How did she figure that out? How did he weather that storm? How did they literally get to that level? You know what they all share in common? They were all able to consecrate their pain and transcend it into something far more beautiful, which means you listening right now, you've got to get to the thank you. And how you get to that thank you is you become aware of what it was that hurt you so bad. And then you ask, why was this good for me? How could this be good for me? What am I learning from this? What is this teaching me? How does this make me a better person? You don't stop asking that. You don't stop journaling what you get until you finally release that cathartic tear of gratitude that says, wow, I probably couldn't have learned this lesson any other way. And you grow and you level up a grade and now you're ready to play a bigger game. You keep doing that, man, you're going to stack up so many MBAs and PhDs. You're going to be freaking the genius of converting pain into meaning. And from those lessons, well, that's how you get billionaires. That's how you get super successful people. That's where you get the marathoners that, that just you know, get gold medals. Like the people that really go furthest in life, they're standing not on the shoulders of giants always, just the mentors they've had, but they're standing on their shoulders of their previous hurts and pains because they found a way to rise above like the Phoenix. Chris, I have had the privilege of having a front row seat for the past seven years of watching you do business, do real estate, do your thing. And I have to say, it's been a wild ride. You, you're different than most people. Um, and I have to admit, Chris, and this goes right into what I'd, I'd like to talk with you about today. I have to admit, I would love to go back, Chris, when you were just getting your start. Oh my gosh. And watch. What a weak, pathetic. No, but but you were it's obviously. Beautiful. It's really beautiful. You were obviously doing things different at that yeah. time than most people because True. you got, at some point, Chris, you left a different train station than most people. Yeah. And and I love that. And I would love, I'd love to see a little bit of insight into that. And that's why this this talk, discussion of of hustle and of learning from our failures is, is critical. Um, all over online when i'm looking at other channels like ours everybody's talking about 2021 real estate mm. um how to find deals yeah. in 2021 they're harder to find well and it's because real estate's doing better it did exactly what we've been predicting for years yep. that, that real estate is just going to continue to go up obviously there's there's you know people anxious about a bubble or things like that but chris i want to can you put yourself in a frame of mind of back when you were first getting started yeah what did your hustle look like back then Dude, I, I was scared. I was really, I was worried. Um, like if I go back far enough, I remember being worried that I wasn't going to figure it out. And that made me feel desperate. And I felt very, very worried and, 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 and constantly anxious. Like I've got to find a way to rise above. And here's what was going on at that time in my life. I, ha I had a full-time job mm -hmm. and I was also going to school full-time. So I was a college student and I also had gotten married like not many months before. And yet I had no time for this woman that I loved because I was waking up at five in the morning, getting on campus, 6 a.m. class, there till 10, 11 or 12, racing to my job, working off until eight or nine o'clock at night. And then I come home to a pile of homework and then just rinse and repeat the next day. You were and adulting big time. I was adulting in a really big <laughs> way. upon you in one Dude, year. I was, I was hating how hard I was working, but Part of me was doing it because this, this incredibly beautiful woman that I fell in love with, she was scared of debt. And so her college was paid for by her parents. But uh, like when it came to money, she had like this freak out like pattern of like, ah, like, like uh, we're not paying rent, you know, regularly, like we, we're, like we're struggling to buy groceries and we have to go into debt for your college, Chris. And that freaked her out and that freaked me out. And I'm like, man. Like I've got to find a way to rise above this. So like my beginnings that led to doing some huge things for me really just came down to just a lot of fear and not wanting to be afraid, but honestly living in a lot of fear. So how did you, how did you funnel that into activities that were successful? <laughs> you know what? Because Chris, yeah, what yeah. you're experiencing isn't, yeah. you know, it's par for the course for most. Yeah adolescent, new college yeah. students that... Dude, Carson, I had to find out how to cheat. 
This is gonna sound horrible. This is gonna, this is gonna, I, I've cheated on tests before. Like, like, like I've cheated. What? I've cheated in my life. Um, I felt guilty from it, and they're like, "Don't do that. Like, succeed on your own merits, right?" No, th- like early days, right? But like, l- let me tell you about a different kind of cheating. This kind of cheating is called shortcuts. Um, often people associate shortcuts as being either a really bad thing or a really good thing. And the shortcut or the cheating that I want to talk about is leverage. So when I did my very first real estate deal, I, I want to share with you what was going on in my mind. I wasn't thinking about doing a deal. I was literally, I knew how hard I was working to make 20 grand in a year. And I was like, this sucks. This is the most money I've ever made. Cause I, before I was a teenager, now mm-hmm. I'm a young adult. I'm in my early twenties. And yet I also was now aware as a married in college, full-time job that 20,000, I couldn't live off 20 grand. Like I was renting the tiniest hole in the ground apartment in Provo. It was like $400 a month, which bought you a 60 year old like dive. And it was one bedroom. And uh, my wife and I were only buying, you know, five days worth of food at the time. And I just said, man, I'm giving 40 hours a week. And at the end of the year, I got 20 grand coming to me. And I was like, I have to find a way to cheat the system. I need more Chris Crohn's. I got to clone myself. And when I caught hold of the idea of leverage, I got really excited. See, when I bought that first home, which took me 14 months of prep, I could do it way faster today, but back then I just, I had limitations. And when I finally bought that home, I knew that I was buying at $40,000 below market. I also knew that I was going to rent my basement and it was going to pay for my mortgage. So I was going to live for free. And in that moment, I'm like, wait a second. A person's, I had already interviewed at my telemarketing job over 10,000 people, and I knew what their number one expense in life was. The number one most expensive thing that you have to pay every month is your roof. Yep. It's, your, it's your living situation. So I was like, wait a second. I worked my butt off to save $5,000 so I can put a $3,300 down payment on this $110,000 home that's worth 150 grand. I'm buying it 40,000 below, and two things are gonna happen. Number one, The moment you sign that paper, which I was terrified to do, it took me like I was sitting down for five hours reading all of the paperwork because I was so scared that someone was going to screw me over. I was scared that I was just going to do it unknowingly. I was scared of what I didn't know. But when I finally signed on it, there was this moment of relief where I'm like, wait a second, Chris, your net worth just went up by double what you make in a working year. You're going to work 2,500 hours this next year. And yet in one moment, you signed on a deal equivalent to you working for 50,000 hours. Sorry, 5,000 hours. 5,000 hours got compressed into a moment? Oh, by the way, your living expense is gone. You have to live for free. I'm like, what? Now, by the way, I was living like super poor, super cheap, but it meant that I actually started getting ahead. So... I needed leverage. When I talk about cheating the system, I don't really mean doing that unethically or immorally, but you know, when I look at my tax breaks and things like that, I sometimes feel like, man, am I, man, I have gamed, I have gamed the system. I think a lot of people follow me and subscribe because I show them how to game the system with leverage. And so I developed a speak around my wife. I didn't, I didn't have the professional language to communicate like I do today. So I would come home to my wife and I said, honey, today, I feel like I've done the work of two men. She's like, what do you mean by that? I'm like, well, I went to school full-time. That's what some people do with their life full-time. I also have a full-time job. So I at least did the work of two people. But then I started thinking, but you know what? I just got this house and I'm living for free. And I have to work for 10 days of the, of the, of the month just to pay my rent. So I also feel like I just cloned myself another 30%. So I, Clint, I did the work today of 2.3 Chris's. And my goal was, I need to figure out how to get to five Chris's, then 10 Chris's. Dude, by the time I had 25 properties and I was raking in in total about $12,000 a month, um, I literally felt like I was doing the work of five Chris's. And all that really meant to me was, I'm using leverage. Today, Uh, Today, I will be in hundreds of thousands of places simultaneously thanks to social media. Like, you're not the only one listening to this episode. You're one of millions of people this week that are going to consume this content, and that's a game of leverage. So I started creating some rules for myself, Carson, which was (laughs) you've got to find a way to cheat the system. And how you do that 
is by the arm of leverage. And let me just describe arm for a moment. Someone once gave me this, um, they gave me this analogy. I'll see if I can talk you through it because I can't show you for those of you that aren't watching my screen. It was about a gate. And they said, imagine for a moment that you had a really heavy 200 pound gate and it was a six foot gate. And you had to manually pull up and open that gate so that you could drive through it. It would take some strength for a person, but because it's on ball bearing hinges, it's, it's, it's not gonna be that hard. If that 200 pound gate, however, were now twice as long, it would be many times easier. If that gate were a thousand feet long, you could literally blow on it and it would open. You wouldn't even touch it. You would literally, with, the, with just commanding air force, whew, you could open that gate. So I learned that the more leverage, the more cheap power. Like the more leverage, the faster you get somewhere. And so I just started creating a filter. Don't do things in life where you're trading your time for money because the moment you are, you That's have leverage. no leverage. You have no leverage. In fact, the person who is making the trade with you has the leverage. Yeah, if, if someone's trading dollar per hour, they're winning. Yeah. So how does this apply to real estate, Chris? Well, dude, real estate is Did just... Did you use leverage to get into your first house? Well, well, think about leverage this way. I go to a bank, my very first house. The bank said, hey, Chris, this is a primary residence. Just like today, you can put 3% down. You want a $300,000 house? 3% is nine grand, and right? Most people think of that as an expense. They're like, oh, I got to have a down payment to no, buy a house. No, no, and it's no, like, no, 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 come no, no. On. Think about this. You're going to have control. No, 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 no. This is a $300,000 house. You're putting nine grand down and you're controlling $291,000 of the bank's money. That. And by the way, that money is free. Like, <laughs> is so low. It's cheap. Everyone should be getting like max, like max out your mortgages. Hello. People cash freak in. out. People freak out when interest rates go, you know, from two to 3%. It's like, oh my gosh, they're so high, three to four. Dude, your credit card often has 26% interest. Well, I'm gonna share with you another point of leverage, but first I just wanna share this idea that I loved controlling banks' money. Second house I bought, <laughs> second house I bought. It was Chris, a, let it be known, Chris loves cheating with the bank's money. Yeah, yeah, dude, well, think about this. Like, I found a house that was worth like $250,000. I'm gonna buy it for $160,000, $90,000 below. And the bank wants 10% down. So I had a home equity line for my first house. The bank was saying, hey, Chris, because you have equity in your first house, you have a $20,000 on the credit. It was like 18,000 something, something. I needed like 16,000 something of that to close on my second house. My first house bought my second house. My second house bought me $90,000 of equity. So now I'm sitting well over $100,000 in net worth and the bank's putting up the other 90% of the money. And then I rent it out on a lease option and I'm making $600 a month of cash flow. So now my house, I'm living for free. I get paid another $600 a month on top of that. My net worth's like $140,000, $150,000. And the bank's like, I'm, I, I, all I did was come out of pocket $3,300 that made these two transactions go. That's leverage. So I love leveraging banks' money. And so there's many points of leverage. But that's, that's the first one is, yeah, I love real estate because I, I like... I'm not even beating the games. Banks at their own game, dude. The banks are happy oh, with what they're getting. Their their economy works on this. My economy works. Well, on Well, and this. if you're renting to to people as well, there are people that need a place to live, and so really that kind of leverage favors everybody in the situation they're in. I, I think that we have a moral obligation, a social responsibility to be good at money. I, I'm going to tell you right now uh, that without dropping any names, I have some associations with individuals that look at me as a greedy money grubbing capitalist. And I'm sitting there and I'm teaching my children a different lesson while I'm sitting on the beach in Florida the other day. Chris, are you talking about your in-laws? No, I'm not. No, I'm not talking about my in-laws. My in-laws are awesome. I okay. love my in-laws, but no, you're not going to get it out of me because should they ever hear this, the last thing I need is a family feud. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Thanks, Carson. No, they're, they're, they're dope. They're awesome. I just call them drugs. So what happened was I'm sitting on the beach in Florida and I'm teaching my, I'm teaching my kids about leverage and I'm teaching them this game of money and I'm teaching them like how the economy works. And I said, kids, this business employs 45 people. So because I'm good at making money and I get that positive arbitrage, I can take care of 45 families. Those are 45 families that, that are able to put food on the table and the, you know, they got roofs overhead. I said, that's a good thing. But I also have a team of 200 experts doing all of my real estate. When you follow the value chain of how many people are involved in my operation, it is thousands of people that are mm -hmm. positively impacted. So someone says money grubbing, greedy capitalist, 
And I look at how much money I'm donating into my 5013C charitable organization for doing the work of breakthrough and emotional healing. And it is a massive arm of leverage that is only growing and only getting bigger. And um, so every year, I'm really measuring one thing. It's not my net worth. It's my leverage. Every year, mm. I need more leverage than the year before. And if we would start thinking, today, I'm doing the work of how many Carsons? Today, I'm doing the work of how many Beths? Today, I'm doing the work of how many whatever your name is. Start thinking that way because when you clone yourself and you learn how to be in multiple places at once and become a more powerful earner, here's what I've learned. When you have more than enough money to pay all your bills, only then do you really possess the financial ability to become benevolent. Only then can you actually put money and energy behind your altruistic desires. Only then can you actually deliver some greater good on this planet. Now, I know that we're always going to find rich, greedy bastards that are all in it for themselves. But you know what? That's anybody. Poor people do that. Like, like everyone, that's the cool thing about life. Like, decide who you're going to want. This is as long as we can keep a free country, for heaven's sakes. As long as we can keep a free country, it's your choice to decide who you're going to be. Um, you, you know, I'm just saying everyone has an o obligation to learn how to do money. My kids have an obligation to learn how to think about money in ways that are productive, that are efficient, that are effective. And to do that, you've got to learn about leverage. That's why I love real estate. To, compared to the stock market. Oh, Chris, the stock market is doing so good. I'm like, great. You understand that you have to average that over 30 years, right? Like, I get that you feel like the world's biggest winner for the last 12 months. But guess what? Like, go ahead and keep playing the game like that will continue. And I swear you will you will become the biggest whiner, victimy, loser on the planet. The house always wins. The house is always going to win. And, and that, that game is rigged to always be that way. Um, it's its own gamble. And, and by the way, do I have money in the stock market? Yeah, I do. And yet, and yet stock market is a form of leverage because it, it, you're saying I can't afford. Well, I, dude, other than puts and calls and margins and things that I'll do, here's the reality for most people in the stock market. First of all, disclaimer, I don't believe in 401ks. I don't believe in IRAs. I don't believe in index funds. I don't believe in mutual funds. I don't believe on this idea of, hey, take the you know top 500 most successful companies and we'll put them in this fund and we'll average out all their returns and then you're going to get five or six percent winnings over 30 years. And I'm like, hey, that sounds really safe, but it also don't compound over 30 years. So you screwed if you were betting on that actually meaning something, meaning do the math. And the math is, oops, my strategy causes me to wind up short. Hence the strategy sucks. Why are most people winding up poorer than they want at retirement? It's because they're going for safety. Mm -hmm. They're going for low ROI because it's safer. I'm like, man, if you don't learn how to take double, triple, quadruple digit risks, you are screwed. Like you do realize that, right? And they're like, huh? What are you talking about? I'm like you're, you're like, you're done for. You're never going to make it. Just do the math. Like fifth grade math. It's just multiplication, a little bit of division, a little bit of addition and subtraction. That's all you need to say. Dude, I was 21 years old and I was just thinking, man, so if I'm the best 401 k'er, if I'm the best ira -er, if I'm the best house payer offer -er, where am I going to wind up? Average adult in their 60s that's really good with money, $172,000 in retirement. Their house isn't even paid off. That will last them two, three, four years. That's and it. And they'll eat their principal. Yeah, and then they're going to eat their principal and then it's all gone. So yeah, that's a problem. So by the way, when I say stock market, here's what I mean. I can buy $50,000 worth of Tesla. And do you know how much it'll cost me to control $50,000 worth of Tesla? 50 grand. Or if I want to buy Apple. How much Apple stock can I buy with $100,000? 100, 100 grand. 000. So we're not talking about some of the advanced stock trading opportunities. What I literally mean is there's no leverage. Compare that to real estate. I can buy investment properties for every dollar I put up, the bank will put up the other four. So it's a one to five leverage. It's awesome. So you should be asking yourself, where do my resources multiply? People understood this, by the way, back in the farm days when we were living off of a barter system and we had animals. When I visited Kenya with my kids, we were doing this, we were doing this really cool mission project and their currency is literally cows, goats and cows. And the cow is their source of meat. It's their source of food, right? But it's also their water. They drink the blood. It, like That's how they stay hydrated in these really hot climates where there's no water around. Mm -hmm. um, and it's their currency. It's what they trade with. So they understand that I make the mommy cow and the daddy cow do the nasty, and then they produce a baby and my, 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 my herd multiplies. And everyone's got to be thinking, how do I multiply my money? Uh-uh. How do you multiply your time? How do you be in multiple places at once? That's what everyone got to be thinking. And, and so real estate is a great way to do that. So uh, what I was going to say, though, not necessarily in how you purchase stocks as leverage, 
But what you're actually doing is leveraging someone else who figured something out. Yeah. Tesla, you're leveraging Elon Musk's genius yeah. to create a company. And you're like, I want in on that because I can't do that on my own, but I can do a part of it yeah. and be part of that ride. And then on the flip side, Elon Musk is usually using leverage by saying, hey, my company has value. Yep. If I let a bunch of people own parts of Which it. Which is why I tell people, it's like, don't, don't invest in 401ks and IRAs. Uh -huh. Instead, get educated on the top stocks and you're looking for asymmetric risk. You're looking for low downside. You're looking for huge upside. You're looking for stocks that can grow over 10 years, 5,000 to 10,000%. Well, and isn't that the definition of leverage, Chris? Asymmetrical risk? It is. And a lot of people don't know exactly what that means. So I'll say it again. It means low downside. It means high upside. And another way of looking at leverage is ROI. So if I can borrow money at 3% mm -hmm. and have it earning 25%, then the middle part I get is what's called positive arbitrage because it's a positive number. In other words, if I can make 25% by borrowing three, there's 22% left over. I keep what's in the middle and that's juicy. Or you know what? Rates have gone up. I'm borrowing money at 6%. <laughs> Listen, if I'm earning 25 on it, I'm still positively netting 19%. That's positive arbitrage. But because people are so safe in their risk appetites, because we're kind of bred to be that way, we don't really want to be risky. And so we're playing the wrong game. We're, we're playing a game of, I'm going to borrow money at four or 5%. I'm going to try to earn six or seven. I'm like, you realize that that's a net, like there's no net real gain there. There's not a tangible improvement that is really meaningful. So you're going to die financially. Benjamin Franklin said, time is money. You know, it's this, this cliche that we hear from time to time. And yet... It's true. Yeah, but no one really believes that until they're making a lot of right. money. Right, and then when they realize that their 24 hours are just as limited as we all have, yours. We, we, all, or... we all have the same 24 hours, which means you've got to figure out what are you worth per hour. I was doing some math with my wife. I was uh -huh. showing her, I said, honey, our business is doubling again this year, and that means that we're going to take home X millions more dollars. And as we did the math on that, she's like, well, Chris, how do you, how do you set goals? How do you know what's worth your time and what's not? And I said... Um, I said, I, I make a list of my top 10 money-making activities and I calculate my dollar per hour. If I do this, I make 50,000 an hour. If I do this, I make 10,000 an hour. If I do this, I make 3,000 an hour. If I do this, I make 1,000 an hour. And what you gotta have is standards. You gotta have a cutoff point where you say, I'm no longer gonna do these other things. See, this is where a lot of people, Carson, they misinterpret, they misunderstand rich people. Uh, like in my life, do I have someone that soccer moms my kids and takes them around, not my wife? Yes, because I have the means to actually recover some of her time, which is important to me for other things that she considers to be a higher, better use. Do I have people that clean my house? I, I do have people that clean my house. Um, I, I pay people to especially do menial things, meaning like, what are the same things you'll do over and over and over again, uh, you know, but someone else could do for you? Well, I don't go to the bank and I don't, my, my number one rule is I don't do errands. I don't do errands. And if my wife doesn't want to do them, I don't believe she should have to do them either. There was a time when we had to, because guess what? We weren't making enough money to pay someone. But when you get to the point, you're like, hey, Chris, like I'm getting more leverage. I used to be worth $30 an hour. Now I'm worth $90 an hour. Well, great. Make a list of what it costs you to run your errands. Well, Chris, that's $14 an hour. Chris, that's $10 an hour. Chris, that's $8 an hour. Great. Could you spend that time doing something or earning more money? Why well, I could. Good. I think at some point for anyone to become more financially successful, they have to figure out how to recover time by dumping projects on other people. That's all a business owner does, right? Most businesses are owned and operated by solopreneurs. The average solopreneur, $46,000 a year. Average graduate post-college, $51,000 a year. Why would you ever want to be a solopreneur and make less money wearing more hats, working harder than you just literally getting a job for somebody else? Uh, like go find a cushier, go find a cushier situation. But it's if you the think, mirage of control, Chris. It, you own a job. Instead yeah, but of then it owns you, yes, right? And it does. But if you become a smart business owner, listen. If a business can't have a lot of employees, I'm not interested in that. More employees means more leverage, more people that I can pay. So I need a margin. I need a company with good margin that makes really good money so that I can afford to feel good about paying other people the money rather than the profits to me. So I get my, my, get back my most valuable resource time, time. right? So everything, you know, my, when you say, well, Chris, take me back to the beginning. Yeah. What was it really like? Like, I think what really freed me from the system is I could run the math really easy on the value of my time. This company values me at $20,000 a year. 
I need to find things that are of equal or greater value. By the way, I want to recount that. I didn't mean equal. You got to only work on projects that are worth double or triple your time so that you're not doing this stupid incremental mindset of, yeah, I'm going to try to grow myself 10% a year. Single digit ROIs don't compound. You got to look for bigger stuff. Oh, Chris, doesn't that mean you're looking for get rich quick? Maybe. Uh, to be honest, I only touch get rich quick. Like if I, like if in five years I can't turn it into a multi, multi, multi million dollar empire, why would I do it? What a waste of my life. Well, Chris, that's thinking really big. No, I'm going to freaking fail a lot. I'm going to learn how to do it. And, and like, I'm a small guy compared to some of the biggest, most successful business owners out there. But guess what? They're leveraging the same thing. They're falling flat on their face. They're trying, they're putting themselves out there. And when they fail, they don't go inside and beat themselves up. They're like, huh, I discovered how not to do something. What can I learn from this? What's the lesson? Because the truth is in childhood, Carson, we learned to fall three times before we would stop trying to get back up. Some people it's one, some people it's five. Most of us, we will allow ourselves to fail three times on average and then we're done. Three strikes, you're out. Literally, it's a thing. But in entrepreneurship, there's no way three goes are gonna lead to a win. Like most crazy successful people had to fall dozens if not hundreds of times before they figured that out and the lessons give you leverage. So but let me just re like recap for a moment. All the ways that you can get leverage. You wanna get leverage on your money, mm -hmm. you wanna get leverage on your time, but probably the biggest thing I've shared today is you gotta get leverage on your lessons. If you've had a bad experience and haven't learned and extracted all the lessons from it, then there's a pileup of near, near, of near lessons, of near leverage that would take you so much further faster and you can't get there because you're not asking the right question. You're too busy feeling bad about why it didn't work. I'm like, screw that. You don't have time for that. Are you kidding me? You're not focusing on the right thing. Focus on the lesson. What am I supposed to learn? So in the beginning, Chris, how did you get leverage? How did I get the what? How did you get leverage? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining a listener at home. They're like, I've got a nine to five, you know, a J-O-B. And I'm like, okay, I got to get more leverage over my time. I got to get more leverage over my money. Where do I start? Okay, so you're looking for measuring positive arbitrage on everything. And here's what positive arbitrage means. Well, I could put my money in this bank earning 1%, but if I switch over to this bank, I could earn 1.5%. And I'm like, why would you waste your precious time to go for something that doesn't produce what I call a tangible benefit? A tangible benefit means that by making, by, that by making the choice, you get a substantial of enough difference that it becomes worthwhile. For example, well, I have a 3.2 rate. I could refinance my house and get 3.1. Okay, whatever you're gonna save, I promise you, it will take you 12 years before the cost of redoing the loan yeah, will actually pay for itself. It's not tangible. So it, it's more like, wow, I was, at, I was in at 9% and then they got me down to three. That's a tangible benefit, right? It's like, wow, it saves me $2,900 a month. So people gotta be asking, how do I get enough positive arbitrage that it's tangible? For example, well, I'm gonna trade this stock because I'm going for a 20% increase this year. Nope. I'm going for the one that has a five to 10,000% increase, knowing that I could risk and lose all of my money because I will lose more than I win, but I become the biggest winner on top because all of my risks have way huge upside and I'm smart enough to diversify so that I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket, okay? So you should ask everywhere you go, how do I get the most leverage? Like, let me just give you a quick example. Yeah. There's someone listening to this that spends two hours at the gym and you gotta ask yourself, how can you show up in a manner to exert the type of energy and do a routine where you can get the near same benefit in just 60 minutes? Because if you can figure that out, guess what you've recaptured? Seven hours a week. Seven hours a week. And best, but guess what? I can start a business on the side for seven, seven hours, hours a week. week. And let's say that business in time makes me 3,000 a month, but my jobs pay me 6,000. I have literally created a 0.5 Chris. I've cloned half of myself because I got six grand from my job and now I have the other 3,000 coming in for my side hustle. But if that side hustle, I could, I'm like, oh man, I could literally pay someone to run the entire operation, but I would have to give up 1,000 of my $3,000. I would do it. 
I'm going to net $2,000. I'm going to pay the other thousand to someone else to do everything. So it only takes me a couple minutes to, to peek in on it because I'm reclaiming my seven hours for what? Another side hustle to see if I can make another three, four. Maybe. But if I learn and get wiser, I shouldn't do the same thing. I should say next time I'm going to dedicate my seven hours to something that only can produce me 6,000 or more. In other words, always go for double minimally. Always go for double minimally. So Carson, where do you have time that you can save is what people should be asking themselves. Or where am I investing my money where I have way better upside and opportunities? As long as I'm smart and don't put all my eggs in one basket and fully research it. Um, that's how you get leverage in the beginning. It's by being smart. And I think that really comes down to this. You have to learn how to vet opportunity. If you don't have a good, if you don't have um, good standards on vetting an opportunity, then you're going to pick crap. You're going to pick something that looks good, but because you don't know what you don't know, you're burying yourself under like a whole bunch of stress that you don't even know is coming your way. And you know what? You will. You will fall on your face. You'll make dumb decisions. I promise you. The goal isn't to not avoid the dumb decisions as much as it is to learn from them when you make them so that you level up your life big time, increase your standards, learn, and then don't have to make those mistakes again. Okay. So it's leverage on your time, <laughs> leverage on your money. And what was the last one? Leverage on your lessons. Lessons. Yep. Yep. And by the way, there's also leverage on skills. Like one of the things that I love from Tony is Tony Robbins will say, hey, what business are you in? But then he'll say, what business should you be in? Uh -huh. In other words, it's like, well, I am, I am myopically in my tunnel building this business and I've been at it for 10 years and now I'm making $20,000 a month. Pause. If that business were gone today and you take all the lessons of everything you learned, is that really what you would rebuild? What if, you just, what if you just shifted and said, wait a second, everything that I've learned or everything I could learn, like what business should I be in? You might find a business that is 10 times profitable, but it's uncomfortable to make the transition. Find a way. That only happens though if you ask good questions. And that is one of those, which is what should I be doing? What would have been a better choice? What should I do next time? And it's not, a, and you got to disassociate from the negative energy of the past where you didn't get what you wanted. You have to learn to interpret that as something beautiful that says the lesson is more valuable than the result. What I'm learning is more important than the money that I'm getting. Well, growing up, um, my dad, uh, he has a TV repair shop. And I think this idea of leverage over skills is interesting because I think my dad is in that business um, because he's really good at the art, yeah. you know, the, the skill set. Yeah. How many positions here at your company, Chris, do you have the, the skill to actually do? And do you have the need to do? Well, so that, that's kind of funny. I always have this saying is that just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. Uh -huh. um, because assuming that ability equates to requirement is how you will shorten your leverage and keep yourself from going further. And further. Like, so in, in my business, dude, there's so many jobs here that I know how to do. But my job is like, also, this is a little bit renegade, but I think it's an idea. It's a worthy thought worth chewing on. When I learn a skill, my goal is to figure out how to hand it off in 90 days. And that means I'll never get to mastery. But it should mean that I can produce enough of a result to understand it and then hire someone to do it better than me. And that's what I'm looking for. There, there are now parts of my company I don't know how to run, Carson. And thankfully so. There are so many things. I could commit some of my time, for example, to memorizing the numbers of my bank account. I have someone else do my banking. Like, why would I do that? Why would I use this precious bandwidth for something that doesn't give me leverage? So one of my filters as I look at opportunities in life is, how do I get leverage? And by the way, this is a question worth writing down. Like, you should keep a journal of powerful questions. How do I get leverage on that? How do I get leverage on that? So for, I'll give you, can I give you a real example? Yes. I'm talking to John Lee Dumas, um, Entrepreneurs on Fire. Dude, the guy the has podcasts. a media empire. He was on one of my podcast episodes just recently. And John's like, Chris, dude, you should come and join me at EXP, right? This is this realty company that is shooting up. They got crazy stock values. Right now, they got about 40,000 real estate agents worldwide. Um, Keller Williams has 160,000. That was the last big splash. And right now, market share is going crazy to EXP because they said, you know what? Keller Williams, it's pretty cool that you will do a profit share but EXP will do a revenue share, which means before you, you know, before you guys take all your profits and expenses and private jets or whatever you do, um, we're actually getting a piece of everything generated. With the gross. And people are jumping on that hardcore. So John hits me up and says, Chris, dude, why don't you do that with me? I said, John, 
I need to get a certain amount of leverage and it's gotta be eight figures or it's not worth my time. So he started saying, okay, Chris, well, how would you develop that model? What would you do? I said, well, first of all, I'm not a real estate agent and I'm not gonna become an agent. So that means that I, you need to go talk to the company at the highest level and get permission that I can have a member of my team be the realtor that all the money flows to as a part of my entire company. So he went and he got that for me. I said, great, you just saved me like freaking 100 hours that I did not want to, nor a test or liability or any of that. I said, okay, number two, if I were to roll out to my entire fan base that you can join EXP, um, there's going to be maybe one experienced agent for every nine that are interested in joining my team. And EXP does not have systems for helping newbies learn how to become very successful realtors. So I said, I, I won't bring this to my people unless I can, unless I can automate that. And so I basically, he said, well, how would you do that? So I built in front of him an entire system where I could essentially recruit three to 5,000 people in 12 to 24 months and probably turn that into, you know, a few million dollars a year. And he said, well, what do you think of that? I said, it's not interesting enough yet. And he said, okay, so how would you make it more interesting? I said, here's how you get real leverage. If I build a system to help non-realtors become realtors and have success, then I would need to recruit 20 to 100 influencers at my size or bigger that would wanna leverage into the same system so that I could then be recruiting tens of thousands of agents into this model. And the guy calculated the numbers and he's like, okay, well, that, now, you're, now you're well over 10 million a year. And I said, great, on top of that, it can't be my primary focus. So here's the tools, here's the resources, here's the permissions that I need. And he said, would that make it interesting? I said, I said, eight figures is one of my minimal standards. Like, do I wanna partner with you to make an extra half a million dollars or $2 million? That's been, like once upon a time, there's a version of Chris that would have been exciting, but that is reverse leverage. That's moving in the wrong direction. I need a big enough stick of leverage for this to actually make sense. And I said, great, so at eight figures, now you've caught my interest. Well, my team's gonna vet it this week. We're gonna look at it. We're gonna see if we like it. We're gonna see if it you know, matches the brand. But the point is, because I elevate my standards and always require more and more leverage, guess what I produce? Oh. I produce more and more results. So Chris, we've talked about all sorts of leverage on your money, your time. I mean, you're giving us an example of leverage in business, but let's bring it back to real estate. So we talked about how you got leverage in, in the beginning. What do you do now that you're like buying hundreds of homes dude, every dude, year? Dude, team. Dude, it's all about team. There was a time when I had agents find deals, but then I had to vet them. And I'm like, wait a second. I can build a calculator that is a natural vetting process so I don't have to do it. Wait, my clients have the same stupid 10 questions over and over about real estate. I should write a book because they're not stupid. I'm stupid for not having an automatic response. Um, and I started looking at leverage everywhere. So today I got... 200 experts that go into the top three markets. I'm opening a brand new market right now. We're getting 30% plus projected ROI on all of our projects right now. We've done thousands of these. And so I have a team now that literally automates the entire process. My involvement is ultra, ultra minimal because I have a team that does everything for me. I don't literally have to do a single lift to make that machine work. So I'm buying hundreds of homes every single year and I've got a team that does all of the work and makes it happen. So I got levers there, you know, but also I spend, think, think about it. I'm, I'm here in studio. Gary Vaynerchuk would probably be proud because I'm literally in studio for four hours max a week. And we produce 700 pieces of content. The team does that produces millions of dollars of you. That's, that's leverage right there. So right. a person should, you know, if there's any takeaway from what we've been talking about today, a person should be asking, how do I get leverage over my money? How do I get leverage over my time? How do I get leverage over my talents? How do I get leverage over my other resources? And what are the lessons that I haven't learned from, from painful experiences where there's huge leverage that will come if I can just get past the pain and learn the lessons? A person should be asking to get leverage in every area of their life if they wanna be the most resourceful, if they want to live their mission at its highest level, if they wanna achieve highest levels of success, and then you bring it back to fulfillment. What really puts a smile on that face? What really helps you feel like you accomplished what you are meant to? Get leverage on that. And that's gotta be a recipe for the greatest life possible. I really enjoyed this conversation about leverage, Chris. When I think about the, the top companies out there that are doing things different, a lot of it has to do with leverage. I mean, you think about Uber, they're the, the biggest auto company, if you will, 
biggest taxi company and they don't own a single vehicle. Why? Because they're leveraging other people's other assets. People's Airbnb. Largest exact. real estate company in the world that has passed up Marriott. Marriott took 30 years to build its multi, it's like 27 or $28 billion net worth. And Airbnb owns no property and it nope. has a greater valuation. Yep. Maybe not during COVID, but hey. <laughs> but talk about leverage, right? Yeah. They're, they're like, hey, other people have this asset. Why don't I just use it? Dude, the, the leverage is all around us. Fiverr. I go there and instead of learning a skill, someone does my Photoshop for 10 bucks. Yep. Like leverage is everywhere. People though, to ultimately Carson, this is what's missing. We have this stupid program in our brain that says, if you want it done right, do it you do it yourself. And we all operate that way. It's, it's, it is, but by the way, it is ingrained so deeply that I've been surprised at how people cannot literally break free from this ultra damning, damaging pattern. And so I developed a new mantra to break my pattern that said, Chris, if you want it done right, don't do it yourself. Break that pattern, look for leverage everywhere you go. And if you can't get leverage, say no. If you think about Amazon, the, the typical retail store, they had to have somebody in their store physically in order to buy a product. And Amazon's like, well, if we just throw open the gates and just mail it to them, yeah. now we've got leverage over the entire world yes. of being able to send product. But Chris, right now, I know, I know there's a solopreneur out there right now watching this or listening to this who is just, just balking at the idea of, you're saying I need to get team members that I should hire someone. I can't afford to hire someone. Final message. Yeah. If final message today for this solopreneur. Yeah. First of all, if you ever, if you're saying to yourself, I can't afford that leverage, you're in the wrong business. You're, you're in a business right now that has so little margin that it is forcing you to work in it. And that means that it owns you. And guess what? It's been that way from the beginning. And I can already tell you your destiny. In fact, what you made this last year, your growth pattern, just map that out for the next 10 years. And if you're not happy with what has been and what is likely going to be, then you have to change. And if you're saying my business doesn't have enough leverage, then I'm just going to tell you right now, you're in the wrong business because you have such small margins, you're forced to work it. So uh, break the pattern, look for leverage everywhere you can. One more exercise, Carson, I think everyone should do. Uh, I said, make a list of the worst experiences of your life, yeah. cash in on the lessons until you can feel the spirit of gratitude and you will grow and raise your standards. Another activity is I challenge you to make a list of 30 ways that you can save time every day and then take inventory on the ones that are the most meaningful and find a way. I challenge you to find three hours a day that you don't have. Three hours a day, you can do so much. Three hours a day, you can start a side hustle, start a business. You have time to invest. You have time to invest in that program. You have time to do the things that you're claiming that you don't have time for. And that's for the time reclamation. And then number three, make a list of where all your money is sitting and ask yourself, what would I have to do to get 10 times the ROI from where it's at today? And then you should be hunting down higher ROI opportunities. And you're right. You'll stand a greater risk of losing money. So you're looking for asymmetrical risk. It's got to be high enough to be worth it. You got to diversify so it's not all, all your eggs in one basket. And now you're approaching it intelligently. Make sure you do your research. But those are three activities that you can do right now to get more leverage in your life. And you know what? Just for fun, I'm going to do one more. Um, fulfillment usually comes down to the people we hang out with. Fulfillment comes down to the loved ones in our life. And right now, I want you to make a list of the top 10 activities that drive the greatest fulfillment and then work those into your day. In other words, have you ever noticed that you could spend all day with a loved one and create no value because you were just busy, not very present, just in the flow doing stuff? Or if you had to and your life depended on it, like you're going to die, you only have two minutes left with this loved one. I bet you could say something emotionally connected, meaningful enough that that two minutes could mean more than an entire day. So you know what? Make a list of what is the most meaningful and you'll save time by doing the things that matter, being all in rather than spending a whole lot of time on things that don't matter. There's a whole bunch of activities. Take it to heart, find leverage, reinvent yourself, beast yourself into a better person. I challenge you, find an extra three hours a day. I challenge you to create more meaningful moments in your relationship. I challenge you to get a 10X on your money that you got right now. I challenge you to learn from your 10 worst life experiences and cash in on the lessons. All of these things will give you more leverage. Anybody that goes through and follows through on this challenge, 
go ahead and send an email to support at chriscrone.com. We'd love to feature you in an upcoming TikTok post or an Instagram post and just talk about the results of taking Chris's challenge. Uh, we believe this stuff works. We know this stuff works. I mean, Chris, your results speak for themselves. Um, super, super powerful stuff. Thank you. Any closing words? Nope. Go rock your life. Rock your life. Okay. Signing off. Stop trading dollars for hours. Ha, 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 ha.